Now, if the eye is by far and away the best camera system that you could ever conceive, then the ear has to be the best microphone that you could ever imagine. At the minute, I'm speaking into a fairly nice microphone that requires tons of amplification. It needs 48 volts of amplification. That's called phantom power. And still, it's not nearly as sensitive as the human ear. So let's have a look at the different parts of the ear and what they do. So first of all, we have the very outside of the ear. You've all seen that before. That's what we think of when we think of the ear, but there's far more going on than what's on the outside. But the outside plays a very important role. It's got a proper name. It's called the pinna, and it acts like a funnel for sound waves. So it takes sound waves and it makes them more concentrated and sends them down what we call the auditory canal. So what the pinna does is increase intensity of the sound. Now you should know that intensity is calculated by power divided by area, watts per meter squared. So if we're funneling sound down a smaller area, that means that we're dividing by a smaller number, therefore the intensity increases. And then you probably know what comes next, that is the eardrum, or to give it its proper name, the tympanic membrane. And it's sort of like a silvery gray color. The eardrum separates the outer ear from what comes next, that's the middle ear. Then we have three very small bones. They're incredibly small and very sensitive. Now you might have heard these called the hammer and stirrup. In essence, this bone here is kind of like a hammer on this stirrup shaped bone here. But let's give them their proper names, malleus, and you might be able to see that that's where the hammer comes from, mallet, incus, and then stapes. Altogether, these three are called the ossicles. These transfer vibrations from the eardrum to the next part, which is a super important part. Well, they're all super important parts, aren't they? The ossicles also amplify the vibrations. And amazingly, they sort of act as an anti-reflection device as well. Because sound waves could be echoed back, as it were, the ossicles reduce that effect. It's pretty impressive. We have a little window. We call it the oval window because there is another window, which is the circular window as well. And that window is the window to the cochlea the spirally bit where the magic happens. Excuse my writing, that's C-O-C-H-L-E-A. And we have nerves that come off there to take the information to the brain. We have something extra as well, semicircular canals. Please forgive my writing today, it's abysmal. Now the semicircular canals, they're needed for balance. So here we have the outer ear with the pinna and the auditory canal. The eardrum separates that from the middle ear, which is where we have our ossicles, and then past that with the cochlea and the semicircular canals and the auditory nerve and all that, that's the inner ear. Now you'll notice that with any microphone or headphones, you have your membrane, but then you can't have an enclosed cavity behind that. If air wasn't allowed to move, then that would mean that the membrane couldn't move as much. And it's the same thing here. You might know that if you swallow, you can actually make your ears pop if you're in a plane or something like that, that's because there is a canal that goes all the way from your ears down to your throat, and that's called the eustachian tube. Now, I should have drawn the oval window a lot smaller than the eardrum. If the oval window is smaller than the eardrum, then that means that, again, the intensity is increased. The oval window then passes vibrations onto a fluid that fills your cochlea. Now, on the inside of your cochlea, it's covered in a membrane. That's called the basilar membrane. And that then connects to the cochlear duct. Now, it's the cochlear duct that's actually connected to the semicircular canals. But the whole point is that in the cochlear duct on this membrane, you have these little hair cells. And it's those that take the vibrational energy and turn it into electrical energy then sent along the auditory nerve and to your brain. Pretty impressive stuff. So let's have the auditory nerve coming here so we can see that it's connected to the hair cells there. Now there are some hair cells that vibrate most at low frequencies and there are some that vibrate at higher frequencies. And you probably know that that is up to a maximum of about 20,000 hertz. If you're doing your A-levels for an old foe you like me, you're probably talking a couple of thousand hertz less than that. Incidentally, if you hear ringing in your ears, it's a very specific frequency that you're hearing. That's because what you're hearing, as it were, are some hair cells dying. And the frequency that you hear 
and the frequency that you hear is the frequency that those hair cells usually pick up. So usually if you hear ringing in your ears, that's a frequency that you're never gonna hear again. Eston chat. Now, how loud a sound sounds? Sure, we know that that's probably gonna be dependent on intensity, isn't it? The more intense the sound, the louder it's gonna sound to you, but it also depends on frequency. And that's because your ear is not sensitive to all frequencies equally. And uh, we are most sensitive to around 3000 Hertz sounds. So if you have one of those machines in school where your teacher turns up the frequency, as the frequency goes up and up to 3000 Hertz, you'll probably hear it getting louder as well, even though the amplitude hasn't been changed. Now loudness works on a logarithmic scale, just like most things in biology, to be honest. Actually, for those musicians out there, if I play you two notes, they are both E, and we say they're both E because they just sound like the same note to us, just one's an octave higher, as we say, than the other one. And that's because the frequency has been doubled. Every time you double the frequency, it sounds like the same note, but just higher. So we can say that the change in loudness between two sounds, how we interpret it, that's gonna be proportional to log of the ratio of those intensities of those sounds. So what does that mean? Well, what it doesn't mean is if you double the intensity of a sound, it will sound twice as loud to you. But what it does mean, much like our octaves, is that e.g. every time intensity doubles or goes up by some factor, but let's just say doubles, loudness increases by same amount, e.g. one, two, three, four. So we haven't got a constant in here, but let's say that I start off with a loudness of one, and if I double the intensity, I end up with a loudness of two. If I double it again to four times, I end up with a loudness of three, etc., etc. That's how logs work. So the problem is, is that we don't have a baseline. Well, what does a loudness of zero mean? So that's why we measure loudness with a variable called intensity level, and that is measured in decibels. Now, I know you've heard of decibels before, but you might be like I've been for most of my life and thinking, I have no idea what decibels mean, what is loud in decibels, what's quiet in decibels. So what is it based off? Well, it's based off the threshold of human hearing. So intensity level, and it's decibels because we have that 10 in front, it's equal to the intensity of that sound divided by I0. Now, what is I0? Well, that is the threshold of hearing, and that is the lowest intensity that can be heard generally by the human ear at 1000 hertz. And that's about one times 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared. So this intensity level is always measured relative to the lowest intensity we can hear. To test how good someone's hearing is, you can draw a graph. What you do is fire lots of sounds of them at different frequencies and different intensity levels, and you measure what the lowest intensity level that person can hear is at each frequency. So you basically keep decreasing the volume, the intensity level until the person says, yep, can't hear it anymore and then you plot that on the graph. So what you'll find is that for someone with normal healthy ears, we said that it's most sensitive at about three kilohertz. That's when you can hear the lowest intensity level. But then somebody who's maybe slightly older, what you'll find is that generally all frequencies are affected, but especially higher frequencies. And so they can only hear very high intensity level sounds at those higher frequencies. Now, I always remember going to the fair when I was a kid, and there was this one time when I was on the waltzers, and one of the guys running it was standing literally two inches away from these massive speakers that were blaring out this music that was even making my ears hurt, and I was about 10 foot away. Now, I'd imagine that this guy is now suffering from noise-related hearing loss. And so what you'll find is his hearing curve looks something like this. It's these frequencies that have been affected. So the rest of those frequencies are okay, but the frequencies that were damaging his ears were the ones coming out of the speaker, and you're talking quite mid-range frequencies there, music, voice, that kind of thing. And so the hair cells in his cochlear duct would have been damaged, 
and that's why we have that spike in there. So that's the basics of the ear. I hope that helps. If it did, please leave a like. And if you have any questions or comments, put them down below. And I'll see you next time.